Hi, I'm Dennis Washington from CrossDig.com and Cross Digital. This is the Cross Digital Podcast. Hope you're having a great day today. Got a fantastic interview lined up for you. Uh, one of my personal friends went to college with him uh, 20-something years ago, Dr. Butler Kane. He is at uh, West Texas A&M University. Uh, it's been out there for a few years now. He's uh, worked since 2010. Uh, with West Texas, uh, very very storied career. If you if you have never met him, uh, fantastic guy. He's, uh, I met him when we were at Alabama together nearly twenty years ago. From there, he's moved on to a variety of areas. He even worked in uh, Seoul, South Korea, uh, where he taught uh, English language reading and writing skills there. Uh, he spent the bulk of his professional journalism career in public broadcasting, uh, including Alabama Public Radio in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, uh, other places around the country as well where he's worked. Um, but like I said, he's currently at West Texas A&M University where he uh, works in the Department of Communication there. He teaches uh, a variety of courses around journalism. His focus uh, is mainly on journalism writing and editing, but uh, he also serves as an advisor to the Prairie, which is West Texas A&M's uh, student newspaper there at uh, West Texas A&M University. So fantastic guy. I talked with him today. He's got a lot of insight about not just in the United States, how uh, journalism and social media has revolutionized the way that media organizations work. But he's also seen some of this globally as well. We touched on this some on the interview, spent a lot of time, though, talking about how his students uh, are being prepared to deal with social media uh, in the professional world and how the professional world uh, is accepting social media. And so for a lot of great insight there and, and, and the whole concept of what we need to do to deal with social media and the changes that are happening in, in media. Just a lot of great topics there. So without me continuing to ramble on and talk about this, let's get right into the interview here with Dr. Butler Kane. Joined now today with Dr. Butler Kane, good friend of mine. Uh, ben Butler and I go back two decades now, Butler, I guess it is. Butler, nice. thanks for joining us. I know. <laughs> yeah, glad to do it, Dennis. Thanks for the invitation. So we've been talking, uh, we've talked for months and years about the changes that uh, journalism sees, and, and certainly you're seeing a lot of that. To tell us, uh, first off, before we get into that, tell us a little bit about what you do, uh, and, and, and then we'll get into some of that as well. Well, my current job, uh, I've been here for going into my fourth year now. I'm an assistant professor at West Texas A&M University. That's near Amarillo, Texas. And uh, I was hired on to be in charge of our journalism sequence. And I'm also the advisor to the student newspaper. It's called The Prairie. And so that's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. I was really hired to, to come back in and kind of uh, revitalize the, the journalism program and to try to move it into a new modern direction. And that's what I've spent the last three plus years working on. And, and it's a challenge, as, as we've talked before, uh, uh, with all of the digital changes that are occurring and all of the, the economic changes that are occurring in, in journalism as an industry. It's a, it's a challenging time, but it's also a time where innovation is, is, a, is a good idea as well. You, you talked, obviously, a lot of changes there. Let's start first with the digital challenges, because uh, there is so many uh, things that are happening even now, and they change so rapidly. When you're dealing with students, what you, what's, what's your biggest challenge with them as far as bridging that gap from what they know about digital and digital products in, and how that applies into journalism? One of the... the big things that, that I try to teach in my classes, and I focus, admittedly, uh, there are so many different types of digital and social media that you, you can't possibly cover everything. And so I, I make it a point to cover Facebook and Twitter for sure, and then we'll, we'll talk about some other things like blogging software or, or you know any kind of thing like that. But when I talk about Facebook and Twitter uh, in class, I try to get the students to start thinking about that not as social media, but as professional media, another arm of professional media, because uh, students are getting jobs now straight out of college. Uh, when they graduate, people are wanting them to use uh, Facebook accounts and Twitter accounts. And, and a lot of our students, uh, those who are going into those jobs, aren't necessarily getting journalism jobs, but they're getting uh, jobs in mass communication. So, for instance, their first job might be to uh, control the Facebook and Twitter accounts for several automotive dealerships or things like that. But they've got to understand how to 
you know, communicate uh, with the public, a good grammar, all that type of stuff as well. So getting back to how they use it, when I talk about professional media, I talk about using it to communicate, using it to make sure people understand what you're doing or your ideas or maybe even promotions, uh, those kinds of things. How not to use them, uh, uh, particularly with Twitter, I say don't use Twitter as a texting service. Don't put things on Twitter that uh, you wouldn't want folks to see anywhere else. Start cleaning up your profile picture. Start um, uh, changing your your bio on Twitter so that when people do come across you, uh, if it's a professional-looking bio, they're more apt to maybe look at your resume a little bit longer, things like that. So I'm trying to tell them to professionalize their social media presence because that will be among the first questions potential employers or internship directors are going to ask them. Do you find that they get that? Is that uh, does it surprise them when you start talking about professionalizing their social media profiles? Some it does. In fact, uh, I have actually seen it in class where we've pulled up people's Twitter accounts before, and then I would say, hey, you know, make sure that you don't have pictures of you, uh, you know, partying on Saturday night or something like that. And then almost before the end of class, I noticed that some of those pictures have changed <laughs> already. <laughs> and so uh, I think it's, it's about changing the mindset. And one of the things that we learned uh, in our classes, uh, talking to my other colleagues here in the uh, communication department at WT, is that we had a presumption that these young adults come in knowing how to use social media appropriately and what they're supposed to do and what they're not supposed to do. And we learned just uh, by through trial and error in class is that that was a poor assumption. They don't always understand how to use it properly and how to use it professionally. And so we have ramped up our efforts in our classes to make sure that we are at least spending some time during the semester teaching them how to use that professionally. And I think it's paid off uh, with some pretty good dividends. Uh, over the last couple of graduation cycles, we've had a number of our students already who their first job has been purely in social media in a professional context. You, you, you bring up a great point there because there are a lot of students – that have grown up with a computer in front of them or a television, uh, but especially, uh, you know, they were part of that initial generation that launched Facebook and, and Twitter, and they've seen it from the ground up, used it from the ground up, and it's been very personal to them. Uh, yet it's striking that when they get into a professional situation, they don't understand how to properly use it, even though they may think they do coming in. Uh, with with uh, from the employer's point of view, do you find that a lot of the employers that you and your students interact with uh, are they pleased with what the students are grasping, or are they are they perplexed as well that some of the students coming through there may not grasp social media the way they need them to? You know, I from my perspective here in the in the academy, I'm finding two things about that, and I think that's a terrific question. Number one, of course. Some of our students get it and are very good. Uh, others don't quite, and that's just, it doesn't matter, the topic or, or, or um, uh, subject matter. It's just going to always be that way. Uh, but we're also finding that sometimes employers, our students will come back, those who are either doing internships or uh, those who have gone on to do their first job, where they're finding that their employers don't have a good understanding of social media and how it can be used to promote their product or to put their uh, name out in front of them or to... Uh, uh, you know, promote their particular points of view about things or anything like that. And so sometimes we're finding that it's our students who actually have a better understanding and a better education on how social media can be used in a professional mass communication context than, than some of these employers do. And that's okay because we see it as a good opportunity for us to be able to educate these employers about, okay, here's what you need. Here's a strategy for you. Let's try this over the next three months and we'll uh, line this out for you. That ends up making our students in our program here at WT valuable to area employers who need to be educated on that. And so we're seeing a little bit of both. There are some employers who are really good. They know what they need, and they can tell us pretty quickly if our students are giving that to them or not. And then other employers are, are saying, please send us somebody who knows a little bit about this, and they can help us get started. It's, you know, And that's one thing that I've encountered when I've talked with some businesses um, they may have some people there that are really good at social media in their personal life, but when they get to work, all of a sudden they they feel like they're behind a business wall and cannot communicate with customers and potential customers. And that, to me, is one of the biggest challenges for any business is to understand that really all you are is just a group of people trying to communicate 
with customers who are another group of people, and all of you share a similar idea, uh, a, a common interest. And you know, I, if it's if it's hard for a business professional to understand that, I can only imagine how hard it is for a 19 and 20 year old student to understand that as well. You know, I, I just got a great lesson about this, Dennis. Just recently, we hosted a, a high school journalism workshop for Texas Panhandle area. Uh, students, high school students, and we brought in a panel of our former graduates, almost uh, practically all of whom deal with social media in, in some regard. It's either a major part of their job or it's, it's just, you know, another part of their job. And, and one of the things I was reminded about is for three of the four panelists up there, the attitude about social media was interaction. We want to make sure that we're getting in touch with people. We want to hear back from them. We're putting ourselves out there. We're asking questions. What do you think about this? Let us know. Send us your pictures of the recent hailstorm. You know, those kinds of things. They're, they're wanting that interaction. The fourth person on the panel, though, dealt with social media as part of her job, but she works for a local uh, regional hospital chain that has corporate ownership, and the name of the game for them for social media is not dialogue. They want to use social media to promote what they're doing or to put out uh, their, uh, you know, um, uh, commercials or to say what they're doing or they've got a new cancer screening machine or, you know, those kinds of things. And so it's not about dialogue. It's, it's sort of a one direction. Like, here's what we've got and here's uh, uh, what you need to know about us. And the thing is, too, that anything that she puts, according to her, on social media has to be vetted. It's got to go through HR. It's got to go through corporate. It's got to go through multiple levels of approval before she can put that out there. And so that was a good reminder for me that some of our students are going to get into a job where it's really wide open. Let's work on some dialogue, put some stuff out there. Let's hear from our, our constituents or from our customers. Others are going to go down and the social media is going to be fairly locked down. Uh, and uh, that's going to be the kind of job that they're going to have to deal with. Uh, you, you raise a good point. I've seen that with uh, some businesses. And, and I think some of that goes back to fear of how social media works. Uh, I in encountered um, a business not too long ago that had very strict regulations about what could and could not be done on Facebook and YouTube. And uh, if there were any comments made, they had to be logged uh, and there had to be uh, some sort of time expiration before it. And I made the point to them, I said, what you're setting up here is some really archaic rules that would not apply if I walked in and asked you in person. If, if I walked in to your business and walked up to you and asked you questions, you wouldn't ignore me. You, wouldn't, uh, you would answer my questions, and I would walk away a satisfied customer. So why am I getting a different kind of treatment if I try to engage you in questions online, whether it be on Facebook or your website. Uh, it's, to me, it, it, it seems like it's a, it's a double standard when the, when the delivery platform changes from personal communication to digital. Yeah, and, and that's something that we have actually talked about in, in our classes as well. It's related to that both on the, on the student side, you know, the professional, and the, the corporate side as well, is that for some reason, and I don't quite understand this either. People have been looking into this. But once you throw the digital interface into the mix, people think that the, uh, the standards that you use, say, for, for normal advertising or normal journalism, you know, uh, or any kind of thing like that, go out the window. For some reason, they think that it's a different thing that you just do different ways. And customer service, I think, is the same way. Uh, to your point, you would never, uh, you know, st have that person standing in your office and you just go about your day. And, you know, right, I've got, right. unfortunately, you know, I, sometimes there was a um, media organization just recently that got brought to my attention where uh, some folks were being a little critical of it on its Facebook page about, hey, you should be covering this story or why aren't you doing that? And ultimately, the uh, organization uh, uh, shut down the threads and closed it down and basically ignored it, uh, to which I wow. think most folks, when you think about that, would say the best thing to do would be to acknowledge it open up a dialogue and say, hey, I appreciate the concerns. What else are you thinking about this? Or we're trying to do this. But in the end, when you, when you uh, shut down folks like that, we all know what happens. They get angry. They get irritated. Right. And they, uh, that doesn't do well for your business, whether it's a media outlet or, or some other. And so I think sometimes folks need to have a, a little 
I, I don't know if thicker skin would be the right <laughs> word, but, but again, it goes back to that dialogue. Acknowledge yeah. that somebody's asking you a question and, and, and talk to them about it. it. It's, it's, uh, I, I, really, I use the word transparency, but it's this, the same thing. I mean, when, if someone walked in and asked you how you're doing something or asked you a question or, or had a complaint about the way you're dealing with your product or your service, if that happened in person, you would talk to them and have a conversation. Well, the same thing needs to happen online. I, I totally agree with that. So Yeah, yeah, I agree too. All right, so it, you, met, you also mentioned earlier about the economic impact that digital and social media is having. How are you seeing that play out uh, as far as educating students go? You know, I think, uh, first off, I tell students this too. If anybody tells them that they have the answer to this, at these all these economic changes and the upheaval that we've seen in, in how uh, – journalism or media is is funded uh, that, that I would tell them immediately they're lying to you no one has the answer right now which really makes it an interesting and, and innovative time I tell my students that those funding models are changing and that uh, don't be too scared about it because we see a lot of people in the market about that but it's also a great time for innovation these types of times uh, require innovation and something's going to come out of it I really do believe it the market will adjust somehow I don't know how that's going to happen just yet. I can tell you one of my biases, though, and, and I'm sure you could at least recognize this, if not appreciate it, Dennis, because of our uh, uh, early public broadcasting yeah. background. And, you know, I spent so many years of my career continuing that uh, as well, is that uh, I think there could be something said for a public broadcasting model. Uh, I wonder, and I don't, again, I, I don't have answers and I don't have all the, a whole lot of studies about this, but I wonder sometimes about for news organizations, mass comm organizations, if they want to explore that to where those who pay for the service are the ones who they are catering to. That's their primary audience. That that might get you away from an, from an advertising format, but of course, public radio, public broadcasting, they have underwriting, non-commercial stations, they sell underwriting as well. Sometimes it's corporate underwriting, but of course, you know, there are differences between what language you can use in a commercial versus what you can use in, a, in an underwriting announcement. And so there are those kinds of things. But I, I would like to play with that model a little bit to see if that might be sustainable enough to where media, social media, I mean, public radio is doing pretty well with it, uh, where newsprint or other types of organizations might be able to go that way. That would perhaps take away some of the commercial pressures uh, on, on journalism uh, to deal with that. But again, I don't know. I don't know. That's, I guess that's a long way of saying, boy, I don't know. <laughs> well, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, people getting paid a lot of money to try to figure that out, too. It's, you know, one thing, and, 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 and I mentioned this to some friends when, uh, when I changed careers earlier this year and left television, local television news. You know, one of the things I told them was there is always going to be value in someone gathering the news. We're always going to need someone to go out and gather the news and do a really good job at that. But the delivery mechanism and, and how that news is delivered is probably going to change. And just as what we've seen with the disruption of newspapers and magazines, uh, I could see something similar happening uh, down the road uh, in, in a few years in television and that uh, people may not consume their news primarily from a television transmitter, uh, but from the Internet or some sort of digital delivery mechanism. Uh, I just think there's a, it, it, but it, it goes back to the bigger point though that there will always need we will always need someone to gather the news for us. Yeah, and I think, and you know, Dennis, you and I have had numerous conversations about this. That uh, I still firmly believe that content is the king. And yeah, that if your totally. content, yeah, if your content is good and solid, and you're you are covering things. I mean, I'm speaking journalistically. If you are covering things that are important to the community or, or it entertains them or, or they, you can build loyalty based on the content that you are providing, then people will be willing to pay for it, I believe. Yep. Yep. And also, I think you would also have potentially still some advertisers at some point, if, you're, if your delivery mechanism is good, that they would be willing to still uh, uh, be in front of those people you are attracting. It might be a different model. It might be in smaller niche markets. It might not be the big mega Masscom that we we have known for all the past decades, but uh, I would believe that when your content is good, you will attract the kind of audience that people would like to be in front of. And sure, maybe their ad isn't what in whatever format it might be isn't going in front of a hundred thousand people, 
Maybe it's going in front of 15,000 people, but right. those 15,000 people are a solid market. And so uh, I totally think there's a possibility that. for that. No, you're right. And, and it goes back to, you know, I've seen the research and, and the success that comes with the idea of niche marketing. Uh, instead of trying to appeal to the lowest common denominator to reach everybody, uh, pick one topic and go after the super fans of that topic and and, yeah. and make your hay that way. So, uh, it, you know, you, we've talked a lot about social media and it's extremely important, uh, but I think there's also, uh, and tell me how you deal with this, the idea of uh, journalism from a digital point of view as far as websites and blogs and that's, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of people, especially when you get in the idea of content marketing, uh, that talk about the importance of having a blog and so forth. Do you find that media organizations and or businesses also see that importance? I think so. You know, I mean, when I ask a lot of my students, how many of you blog? Let's talk about blogging, for instance. Very few of them do, actually. And uh, it, it's always a little bit of a surprise to me. And, and the feedback that I'll get sometimes is I don't have a whole lot of value in it. I don't see a whole lot of value. Or they'll start and they'll, be, they'll start blogging about something that they think they should be blogging about. And, of course, it dies in about, you know, three posts. Right. And so one of the things I try to encourage them, if you want to explore this idea of blogging, I personally think that you're going to have most, the most success with blogging about something that interests you. Don't think about it in terms of, well, I think people would be interested in, in this obscure, you know, notion or idea, and I need to be the one who's going to blog about that. It, you will fail practically every time. Right. And so if you blog about the things that you are interested in, that will sustain you. You'll want to continue blogging about those things. You'll be interested in blogging about those kind of things. And the audience, if they are interested in that, they will find you and stay with you too. It doesn't mean that you're not, you shouldn't promote yourself, of course. But right. um, who cares? You know, my, I do some blogging and I don't know, I've got a few followers, but it's nothing <laughs> compared to some of these other people. And that's fine with me because I'm not interested in trying to have 500 followers on my blog. I'm interested in blogging about stuff I like. And if other people like it and they, they respond to it, that's what rewards me for blogging. And so I think that's where, where folks, our students can start and then, you know, go from there. And if it gets big, fantastic, but don't let a sudden growth spurt change what you do because you got that growth spurt because of what you do. So don't use that to change or try to, now I've got to appeal to this bigger audience. Every time I've seen a blog that's tried to do that and enjoyed some success, then they try to change because they got certain expectations on themselves now, it almost always goes south. And so I think stick to what you like and what you're interested in, and the audience will follow or it won't, but you'll still be successful in your, in your own right. I totally agree with that. That's, you know, and, and it comes back to the idea of sustainability. If you're going to have a blog um, that you contribute to on a regular basis, you're going to need to be extremely interested in the content of it. Uh, if it's boring to you, it's going to be boring to other people. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, exactly. So, it, but from a, uh, let me ask you this though, from a business perspective, a business that obviously is interested in its own product or service, uh, you know, I, I visit a lot of websites for businesses and if they do have a blog, they're usually very sparse. They're, they're not well kept up. Do you find that business, a disconnect there with businesses understanding the value of their own websites? Yeah, and, and you know, uh, and I look at this mo mostly from, from uh, you know, journalism outlets and things like that. One of the things that I, I see regularly, uh, one of those outlets, is that they're trying to push blogging because that makes them look like they're fresh and they're keeping up. I would think, you know, in my advice, and you've done uh, much more research than I have on this, Dennis, that for me as a consumer, I tell my students to think about themselves from the, from the, uh, the reader or viewer's perspective all the time, you know. And so right. well, how would you react if you saw this at a website right. or something like that? And so my thing that I tell them is if you go to a website and you see that the blog hasn't been updated in two weeks or three weeks, what, uh, that says something to me as a potential consumer that it's not a priority uh, for them. And it also makes me wonder, well, this is old and they haven't kept up with this. What else are they not keeping up with? And, and have they let something else slide? And so right. – I think if you're going to keep a blog, you need to at least keep it on a schedule, even if it's weekly, and you'd let everybody know this is going to be updated once a week. At least you're keeping up with the schedule, and you've set an expectation, and you're meeting it. Wow. But otherwise, uh, folks might have, you know, they can stumble across your site or go to it and think, you know, I don't know if these folks are really keeping up with stuff. Maybe I'll go on to somebody else. 
Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. And it goes back to the idea of, of letting people know your, you know, what to expect from you. Uh, you know, don't make promises you can't keep. Uh, and, and letting people know. It, it, one topic I wanted to, to make sure we had enough time to get into today a little bit was the, uh, you know, we've already touched on this some, the, the changes that journalism and, and media organizations are facing. What do you, you know, we, we've seen the disruption that, that the Internet has played in that and then uh, a lot of discussion uh, in the last few years about uh, over-the-top and on-demand viewing and, and TV everywhere and that kind of thing. And, and then, of course, newspapers dealing with, how the internet has has dramatically changed the way their products are consumed. Five, ten years from now, what do you see? How, how do you see a successful media organization being run? Boy, yeah, that is that is so such a great question and so difficult to answer as well. And I sorry, and, I just uh, wanted to throw. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thought I would, I didn't want to give you an easy question, Eric. You know? uh, yeah, I need. Let me find another cup of coffee here <laughs> real quick uh, before I do that. But uh, well, you know, the truth is, is that we are. Part of my job is to sort of help set that up every day in class. I mean, I, I'm in a privileged position, and I really mean that. It's a, it is a privilege for me to be in, in the position that I'm in, being a, 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 a faculty member at a, at a university here in the United States, in that I, I literally interact every day with the people who are going to bring these changes five and ten years down the road. Uh, and, and, you know, we don't know what those changes are going to be yet. I don't know how many in my classes that I see today. I don't know if any one of these people or a group of them might be the ones to find the funding model that works. Yeah. Or they might be able to find the delivery mechanism for content that, that changes the next 20, 30 years, uh, something like that. And so what I try to teach, and, and I don't know if this is exactly the the, uh, the one answer, you know, that I could, could give you for this, but what I try to teach my students, I tell them every day that I want you to be critical thinkers and savvy, savvy communication people. Understand what the business is doing. Look at what you're seeing. Try to find the things that you, try to think about things that you aren't seeing. Right. Like uh, when we talk about how could we fund this, what are people not talking about? I don't care if it is the craziest off the wall idea you could come up with. What hasn't come up yet? Try to think about those things. And I think if I can foster, I don't think I can do a very good job of saying it's going to be this in 10 years to start working toward that. I, I don't think I have that kind of foresight. Uh, if I did, you know, I should have gotten in at the bottom of, you know, Yahoo or something right. 20 plus years ago, right. you know, and, um, and, and do that. But what I, what I am trying to teach my students uh, is to be innovative and try to think innovative and try to think critically so that five years down the road when they have a little more classroom experience combined with a little more professional experience, 10 years down the road, how can they think critically about whether something is working or not? And then how could that potentially work? Let's try to try some crazy off the wall idea. I try to encourage my students to fail in class and uh, at the Prairie, at the student newspaper, Try something that you're not sure if it's going to work. If it's if it fails, that's fine. We've learned something here, yeah, right? Yeah. Let's see if we can innovate, you know, another way. And so I think, and I think this is actually a challenge. Let me let me, you know, maybe be stereotypical about some of the younger generations. I don't think they're they're encouraged to fail a lot. I think they're encouraged to win and participate and and uh, to not fail. And I think that's that's bad for media. I think we need to encourage people to fail because if you fail, that means you are trying something that maybe hasn't been done or you're taking a risk yeah. and it's okay to take those risks. I have no idea how that might turn out in five years, but I think if we have a culture of people willing to take risks in a responsible way, mm -hmm. that uh, we'll, we'll see some innovation come out. No, I totally agree with that. Well, listen, I know we're, we're running out of time here, but I did want to uh, quiz you a little bit about what you've got going on. I know uh, you this past summer made uh, several overseas trips, uh, at least one with a group of students there from WT. Uh, what uh, what you got on your plate coming up? Well, we have been, and thanks for mentioning that. I, I had a crazy summer. I got to travel a pretty good bit. I got to spend some time in Asia and then spend some time in Europe. And finally, most importantly, spend some time back home in Alabama, of course. Uh, but uh, 
Uh, we are working on uh, doing some more travel writing here at WT in my program. We are making plans to go back to Asia, to South Korea again in a couple of years. That was what we were over there during the summer. We were doing some international travel writing and wanted to do that. Uh, one of the things that I would like to do in our program here, I don't consider myself an entrepreneurial journalist. Uh, I don't have a business background. That's, that's some education that I'm trying to get along the way as well. But I do want to uh, introduce our students here to a lot more international news and look at media systems and how they function and perform in other countries because we have our own way of doing things here in the United States. It's not the only way. In certain, cer certain circumstances, it's not always the best way. And so mm -hmm. um, I'm wanting to expose them to those kind of things, and I'm trying to foster uh, a being interested in the media system that we have. As I was talking about earlier, I want people to be uh, culturally sensitive. I want them to be critical consumers of what we're doing. Uh, I teach, one of my things is I always teach all of our students to learn the First Amendment. I want them yeah. to know the First Amendment so that as professionals and as students, they can understand what our entire system of free speech and press is built on. And so if they can learn the First Amendment and learn, learn the rights that come with that, I think that makes them better media consumers. It makes them better media critics, and it makes them better media practitioners. So, so that's something I'm trying to work on. I, I love it. I love it. Sounds great. Well, Butler, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate you joining us, and good luck on all this stuff going on. Hey, Dennis, thank you. It is a privilege to get to, to chat with you. You you and I go way back. Uh, I have high, high regard uh, for you as a friend and as a professional, and I'm looking forward to seeing this venture succeed as well. But uh, you know, you don't have to ask me twice to talk about media and journalism uh, anytime. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thanks, Butler. Thank you. And again, that was Dr. Butler Kane from West Texas A&M University. Just a fantastic interview. Hope you got as much out of that as I did. It's one of the things that when he and I ever get together and talk, there's a lot of things we talk about, about how our business and journalism has changed so much over the last 20 years. Uh, but it's not one of those feelings where we're in despair. There's a lot of hope for the future. And I certainly get that from him as well. It's it's an exciting time. There's a lot of challenges ahead, especially for your traditional media organizations. But for the ones that are going to succeed, it's going to be an opportunity to really engage audiences in ways that they've never been engaged before. Uh, and, but it goes back to ultimate concepts of being transparent with people. Uh, tribal marketing, the idea of working together with people that share your common interest, uh, and you being a leader of that. There's just a lot of great opportunity there as well. Uh, certainly something uh, that we can all learn from. So again, my appreciation to Dr. Butler Kane for taking time today uh, to visit with us here on the Cross Digital Podcast. If you've got someone that you think would make a great interview, I would love to hear from you. Just visit me at crossdig.com, send me a message, let me know who and why you think this person would make for a great interview guest and uh, we'll certainly put it on the the list of possibilities love to hear from you there thanks so much for listening to the cross digital podcast i'm dennis washington